Greetings, legendary listeners. Welcome to the Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And today we are all about the second episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Every week we analyze the latest chapter of the MCU from all sorts of unique angles. On Monday, Christine Kippens and I will bring you our character cast, which will take stock of the fates and choices of Sam, Bucky, John Walker, and more. On Wednesday, Jesse Taylor and our show PonderVision will return to get into the episode's biggest and most uncomfortable questions. But as always, we begin our weekly analysis with this show, StoryCast. This is where we break down TV episodes not by plot, but by themes, symbols, illusions, and archetypes. You will not get this kind of analysis on any other Marvel TV pod or any other TV pod at all. I am your host, Mark Folletti, and today I am joined by our two story experts from Salon.com, writer Amanda Marcotte. Hey, Amanda. Hey. And from Manhattan College, professor of English and our favorite supervillain, Dr. Maeve Adams. Hi, Dr. A. Hi there. All right. So once again, Falcon and the Winter Soldier proves people who are anxious about it being just an empty smash em up wrong, right? There's a whole bunch to talk about tonight. Yeah. <laughs> So much. I mean, I think like we made a lot of notes and we will we'll be lucky if we get around to half of them. Yeah, seriously. I mean, you know, you get all your great action scenes, but then you get all this other really thorny, meaty stuff to think about. Um, It continues to be an extraordinary series. Yeah, I I hate to be shallow, but those action (laughs) scenes really keep doing it for me. That that fight on the top of the semi trucks was really exciting and had the same quality as the fight scene we got in the last episode in the canyon, where it's just this incredibly visceral experience. And something Jesse said on PonderVision I thought was true is it it's really good at placing you in the action. Like you don't feel untethered you're like feel connected to the space and time of it in a way that you don't always get in action scenes so anyway that stuff is really great but we are here to get into all of the structural underpinnings of the episode the narrative forces behind it the (laughs) themes that unlock all of the stuff that actually resonates with our hearts and souls (laughs) So look, a lot happened in this episode, right? Sam and Bucky got on screen together for the first time. They pursued the Flag Smashers. John Walker gave his life story and appeared. They started to work together, then kind of didn't. And at the end, we learn there's one more factor coming into play, and that is Helmet Zemo. So let's talk about the themes driving this episode. Amanda, what did you feel like was the theme that stood out to you most driving all of this story? I mean, it... it It was really very much the theme of identity, but more specifically kind of the idea of like who gets to tell someone who their identity is? Where does identity come from? Like who defines what somebody's identity is? Is it the person themselves? Is it just always a self-defined thing? Is it a communal thing? Is it something that can be imposed? And I think that there's not an answer to this question. And, um, I don't think there ever will be, but the episode really, I think, dealt strongly with the... It's actually kind of the reason is that the answer is all of the above. (laughs) But, um, you know, the episode... But those are conflict points. There's always conflict points there. And I think this episode really kind of delved into the kind of conflict points um, around identity, who gets to wear an identity, who gets to to say who somebody is. Hmm. So talk to me a little bit about where in the episode you saw that theme coming up. I mean, obviously, right away, we get it with John Walker, the new Captain America, Mm. um, his his own doubts about whether he can be Captain America, his wife telling him, just be yourself and, and that will be good enough. And then throughout the rest of the episode, his right to be Captain America and what it means to have a new person in that role is litigated. You know, his friends say he can do it. Um, He has doubts. And then, of course, obviously, Bucky and Sam believe he cannot (laughs) be Captain America (laughs) and that he has no right to take that identity. But it came up in in different ways. I mean, I think the most powerful scene was when Isaiah, and I'm going to guess that's Isaiah Bradley, and we'll get to that in a second. (laughs) Um, Isaiah the old man tells Bucky, you don't get to decide if you're a killer anymore, right? I'm paraphrasing a little. 
Um, and Bucky bristles at that. And then Isaiah kind of asserts that, well, maybe you do and kind of suggests that who gets to self-identify in our culture is very much dependent on things like race. Yeah. And then there were like kind of small ways they reinforce this. is Like this is good writing. They reinforce the theme over and over again. When Sam tells Bucky, he can't tell him what his rights are in terms of whether he gets to be Captain America. Uh, yeah. Sam telling that kid, I'm not the black Falcon. I'm just the Falcon. And Bucky saying, I'm not the, the white Panther. I'm the white wolf, you know, little things like that, where somebody tried to assert an identity on somebody else and, and they rejected that person's right to do that. It's funny too, because those, those scenes where, I mean, I guess specifically that scene where the, you know, the, the kid says, my dad calls you black Falcon and, and, you know, and Sam, you know, says back to him, do you call yourself black kid? <laughs> Right. It's a, it's, and of course, you know, it's not as simple as that, right? It's not just as simple as the kid being like, no, I don't. You know, Sam says to the kid next to him, I got him. And they have this sort of communal laugh because there, you know, there's something actually, a, you know, a serious philosophical question at the heart of that, right? Which is how we conceive of identity as a first person product, right? So in other words, like uh, here I am, you know, Maeve Adams or Dr. A, as I am now <laughs> going to prefer to be <laughs> called. You know, and, and of course, I, you know, I've decided on that, like this little Dr. A, or I guess Mark decided on that, to be fair, you impose that on me, I feel oppressed. Um, That's true, I did. <laughs> but, you know, I'm it's the power a, broker. <laughs> it's a fiction, right? But it's a fiction that, you know, that we collectively decide on. I, you know, I had a, I had a conversation with my um, niece a couple weekends ago, where uh, she just got this like comic book about feminism. And she was like, you know, she was curious about why it is that we think about boys and girls. And I was like, actually, that's a really serious question. Like, why is it that I don't like walk into a room and say, hi, I have hazel eyes. Because <laughs> nobody really gives a shit, right? Like, yeah. because we've not decided that those are the powerful categories, that those are the categories that determine identity. And we don't get to, the sad thing is we don't get to choose those by ourselves, right? Yeah. And that, I think that scene, you know, with Sam and the kid and the scene with Isaiah and Sam and Bucky are about that problem. Yeah, the scene with the kid has an extra resonance in any TV show because you know there are just countless kid roles who have been framed in the screenplay as black kid. <laughs> and I feel like this was a very non-subtle call out to yeah. those kinds of writers out there who've been identifying characters that way in screenplays for generations. Well, and, yeah. and when we were watching it, Mark set pointed out also it's a meta joke about how, you know, they've gotten away from it, thankfully, but there's still this kind of area where a lot of old superheroes that were black got called black this or black that. And sometimes it sticks like Black Panther and sometimes it doesn't, you know, because it is a little bit, it's like women's sports and people want us to stop saying <laughs> women's sports. Like you're, you're, you're kind of making a spectacle, spectacle out of somebody's difference. Mm-hmm. Right. And, but on the other hand, you can kind of see with Black Panther how that is something that has another way of being interpreted, which is that it's cool and right. it's empowering. And obviously the kids saw it and his dad see it this way, which is why they attach the, this kind of um, adjective to Falcon. And it, it was a fun kind of a moment that just really resonated on many levels. And also, you know, I, I think one of the other things that's kind of cool that we can't leave out of this is just how cool it sounds to say a color than an object which is why you also have white wolf, red wing, (laughs) you know? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I think sometimes um, people kind of want that adjective, even though any writer would tell you drop adjectives when you can. Amanda, I like to think I've read a lot of comics, but you've read a comic I have not read that relates very closely to this. Can you talk a little bit about truth, red, white, and black? Yeah, so um, I have not finished it. It's only a seven-run series from the early 2000s, and it is a very, very dark comic. So one of the (laughs) reasons I haven't finished it is every issue is just super heavy, man. (laughs) Um, And But it is um, this comic run that Marvel commissioned where they told kind of um, not an alternate history, but a hidden history behind Captain America, right? And so the premise of the comic is that before Steve Rogers was Captain America, before he took the super soldier serum, the U.S. Army experimented on a group of black soldiers 
and it's v- very much got the Tuskegee kind of echoes in Ooh. it. So you have all these black soldiers that um, get it. A lot of them get killed or uh, murdered in the process. It's very grim. And the nut, there's a, f- a number of names in there, but the number one character that is kind of in the comics is a guy called Isaiah Bradley. Oh, and he wow. is the first black Captain America, right? And so oh. the premise of it is that they have these black super soldiers. And unlike Steve Rogers, who gets to be the, the shining hero on the cameras, these guys are out there doing the dirty missions, the like the the black ops kind of stuff that the US military doesn't want to admit they're doing, right? And and they're use and they're leveraging their threats against their families to make them do it. Like I said, it's a super wow. dark comic. And apparently Steve Rogers is going to come visit them and lead them into one mission into Germany, but he doesn't make it. So Isaiah has to go by himself and he's like, "You know what? Fuck this." And he puts on the Captain America uniform and he goes into a concentration camp where they're doing science experiments on Jewish people and just kills the fuck out of a bunch of Nazis. Right. And it's, yeah, it's, it's both cool and very disturbing because obviously the, the parallels are supposed to be between white Americans doing that kind of scientific experimentation on black Americans right, and the Nazis doing it on Jews. But also you get to see these like issues of identity, right? Isaiah is told he can't be Captain America, but he's like, no, fuck you. Yeah. I am Captain America. And he claims that identity for himself. And so I was pretty thrilled watching the show. And all of a sudden, who walks on screen? <laughs> Isaiah Bradley. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's wow. pretty incredible. And for those who don't know, um, the Tuskegee study that Amanda was referencing is that something that happened. Um, the United States government functionally spent 40 years abusing a group of black men that they put into a study, they were told they were going to be given free health care. In fact, they knew that several hundred of them had syphilis. They did not give them the accurate diagnosis. They studied the results of the disease. They were used as guinea pigs to figure out what happens when syphilis goes untreated. And it's one of the most egregious medical crimes that we know of, certainly in the U.S., but really arguably anywhere. And the fact that it went on for so long when they were told this study was supposed to just last a little bit of time, so many of these men had no idea what happened to them. And I know eventually President Clinton had to apologize for it, but I mean, what does that do for people? So, right. you know, back in this episode, though, I do think there's just a ton of other textual evidence that relates to this theme you brought up, Amanda, about who gets to define someone We talked about Isaiah, you know, we talked about his conversation with Bucky. Another thing that came up with Bucky was during the couples therapy scene. (laughs) Uh, My favorite scene of the entire episode. So adorable. (laughs) One of the things that jumped out to me was how Bucky was relying on Steve's definition of him as a good person. That the essential aspect of Bucky's redevelopment of his personality relies solely on Steve's judgment and the fear that he was wrong about Sam would mean that then Steve was wrong about him. And we realize in that moment just how fragile Bucky's sense of self is, that this one judgment of this other person, granted, the person closest to him and everything else. It's also Captain America. Also Captain America (laughs) has a lot of weight. Um, Still, that's a devastating realization to see just how much that defines the entirety of like the sense that he has any hope of redemption at all. Well, it's funny, though, because the, the flip side of that, and, um, you know, it, it might be seem strange to to make this comparison, but the flip side of that are the flag smashers when they arrive at the safe house, um, you know, they're a rate. So the aliases have shown up, their aliases have shown up on the on, you know, probably some kind of international, you know, criminal alias database or whatever, whatever they're using. Interpol. In that, right. Well, whatever. Yeah. Interpol or whatever they're using in that world, that's sort of the equivalent of that. And the the immediate response is to erase those because and and I think it's not just because they're trying to not be found out, right? The the conversation that's just happened with Carly and the guy who owns the house who his whose wife has made all this delicious chicken liver for them. <laughs> Yum. Whatever. It's uh, I actually like chicken liver, so you know I I'm I, it sounds pretty good. Um, Amanda read that that scene as uh, Carly being vegetarian or vegan, which I thought was a pretty good read. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Um, but what's funny is that, you know, he says right before they have the conversation about erasing the aliases from the databases, he says, you know, people are seeing you as Robin Hood, which I think is exactly how she wants to be seen, right? Like their self-conception is wrapped up in the way that other people that they want to have admire them see them. So very similar to Bucky, right? Bucky wants to to be seen as, a, a, as not a bad guy. Yeah. Right. And of course, it makes sense in the history of Bucky's sort of, you know, experience. But I think it's interesting that there's that par- parallel there that the flag sm- smashers also don't want to be seen as criminals. They want to be see they want to be seen as true heroes. And that act of like erasing the aliases and and narrating, you know, hearing the the sort of the the idea that, you know, she's Carly is seen as um, a Robin Hood character is I you know, I think it's an interesting parallel um, between these two groups. And it's like really arguable that the Robin Hood story is kind of one of the oldest versions we have of these kinds of stories, right? Where hmm. where yeah. you're where the theme of the story is very much on the ambiguity of identity because Robin Hood and his merry men are according to some people heroes and according yep. to other people criminals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you know, it's we've we've of course we've narrated it, it you know, from present to past in precisely that way, that these are kind of vigilantes who are doing good work in the world. But we know the vigilantes, vigilantism rarely yields good results for everybody. <laughs> well, but what's funny about that, of course, is superheroes you know, are, occupy the same space in modern society, right? Like yeah. they are our stories of these kind of people who often just reject, like they see the flaws in kind of the system of justice that exists and they take it upon themselves to enact justice. And usually they're right, right? Just like Robin Hood, but obviously it doesn't work that way in the real world. And I think the Marvel movies have started to get a little bit more complicated around that, even though ultimately our heroes always still end up being heroes. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, that is in this episode too, right? Sam and Bucky, when they decide to sort of break off from Captain America, articulate exactly that, right? Like they say to Captain America, you, there are protocols that you have to follow and we don't have to follow those. And so we're going off on our own and you, good luck, you know? And of course, Captain America is like, has that again, there's, there's that moment. And also there's, there are a couple of other moments in the episode where he gets this kind of sinister look on his face, um, which maybe I'm overreading that, but uh, you know, it's a little worrisome. He's like, basically, don't cross me, like, don't get in my way, because if you, you know, if you do, then, you know, I'll I'll do terrible things. Yeah, they made him such an interesting character because yeah. you can relate to him more than I think we thought that was going to be the case after we saw his smug grin last episode. Yeah. But there's definitely an undercurrent of something unsettling going on there. I will point out that um, something that came up in the first episode and is in this episode, too, is that is you have John Walker and his sidekick who both work for the U.S. government are actually like uniformed military. And then you have Sam and Bucky who are no longer in the U.S. military and work on their own under contract and there we have a word for people who do that they have not used that word but it is mercenary (laughs) right true yeah all the mercenaries get paid uh, well sam says he got paid that's true he's on a contract i don't know if bucky's getting paid yeah so lamar hoskins said sidekick aka battlestar fun fact was originally a bucky in the period before winter soldier happened he was someone who tried to play that role and actually in the comics they reference the fact that that was a super fucked up thing to do because bucks were terms that slaveholders used for slaves and he took his own name which was Battlestar. So there's uh, a lot to sort of explore with this character of Battlestar in the comics again for folks who are interested. He actually fights US agent who is John Walker uh, in those comics too. So we'll see whether they take the character in another direction, Maeve, what works of TV, film, or literature jumped out at you related to this theme of identity and who gets to define someone? Well, you know, I was thinking a minute ago, um, we were thinking, we were talking about the Tuskegee experiment and and sort of thinking about the way that identity and kind of power intersect with one another. Because there's a, there's a literary critic um, named Edward Said that people might be familiar with who... Um, wrote a couple, uh, several very important books, 
to um, one called Orientalism and culture and imperialism that are related to this, that, you know, that, that basically one of the things about empire is that empire contained within it the power of those who were imperializing to define the identities of those they imperialized, right? So the French could say, these are French colonies and these people are French. The British could say, these are British colonies and all of your uh, products are now British, right? right? And it's not just like a economic colonization. Yeah, they it's, take um, their language it's, a lot of the time. Yeah, and their identities, right? Like they define their identities and that power to define identity is one that in the modern world is a distinctly imperial power, an imperializing power. And of course, it has roots in things like the Bible, where, you know, Adam gets to name, name all the things of the earth, right? And just a um, little fun fact from American literary history, um, you know, Mark Twain, the American writer, wrote a, a book called The Diaries of Adam and Eve, <laughs> where Eve makes fun of Adam for naming things stupidly and then names a stuff herself and just makes fun of him most of the time. So it's this kind of satire of that idea of Adamic power. That's what it's called when philosophers and literary theorists and critics talk about this thing in the Bible where Adam gets to name everything. They call it Adamic power. Um, but it is, my point is that it is power, right? It's power to be able to define who people are, what they are, and to be able to define how they define themselves. Like me walking into room to a room and saying, my name is Maeve, clearly identifying um, in a kind of, as a, as a woman, right? Versus, and people seeing me that way, rather than seeing me as, I don't know, a person with hazel eyes and purple hair <laughs> and a hitchhiker thumb. Yeah. You know, yeah, <laughs> um, and and not to be make everything Amanda Marcotte's uh, clap happy feminist hour, but I mean, <laughs> I think you know, obviously, please do, <laughs> but obviously, like one of the most um, biggest struggles ongoing in our culture is over whether or not women get to name themselves or whether women yeah. get to keep the name they were given at birth, um, whether men get to name women. Yep. You know, after themselves when they marry them, or if women can keep their own name, and it it is. Still very rare. You wouldn't think so, but um, still only about 10% of women keep their name when they marry because that endemic power um, yeah. is just very, people don't like to give it up very easily. Well, and we see it in the transgender community too, right? Like even it, in some ways, it, it comes to the surface in a very different kind of way, but where, you know, folks who feel like they identify as a woman, for example, are, you know, want to be able to name themselves and, and the hurdles that people have to go through just to get even the state to recognize that a person doesn't want to be identified as male, wants to be, uh, you know, as, uh, via a masculine pronoun, for example, um, and wants to be identified as uh, via a feminine pronoun. It's just the hurdles are extraordinary. Seeing friends of mine go through this, it's just, you know, and again, it goes back to that Adamic and it's patriarchal, yeah. right? It's like, it is fundamentally patriarchal and Adamic. And, and, and you know, kind of touching on the racial issues of this particular show, this is also something that a lot of uh, civil rights and black activists in the 60s, 50s and 60s, I mean, that's why Malcolm X's last name is X, because a lot of people decided to shed what they called slave names um, because they were names that were, they were names that were given to them their families by people who bought and sold them into slavery. So there was yeah. a, an attempt to get away from that. I think that some people are, are still invested in to this day. Yeah. Amanda, did you see any other works of literature that jumped out at you as influences on this theme? Well, when I think of like the power of naming and I think of like identity and who gets to, to assert it. Obviously the book that always comes to mind is, is Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. Oh, which interesting. Is, How so? Well, I mean, literally the first lines of the book are Lolita light of my life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He, I don't remember exactly the quote, but he's, <laughs> he calls her, he calls her all these names except for her actual name, which is L Dolores Hayes. Hmm. Right. And which is, uh, you know, everything in, in Nabokov's writing is puns like Dolores means sad. Hayes is probably a reference to how hard it is to see the actual girl through Humbert Humbert's, the narrator of Lolita's 
attempted erasure of her actual self. But it, for those who don't know what this book is, because it has a lot of <laughs> meta history around it, the actual book is not a book that's celebrating pedophilia. <laughs> <laughs> it is a book, um, it is, Martin Amos called it a book about oppression told from the oppressor's point of view. It is a book about pedophilia written from the pedophile's point of view. It is very anti-pedophilia. <laughs> a, a number of people get confused about this. But one of the most important things in the book is that the girls, he, he forcibly renames his victim, whose name is Dolores, and he calls her Lolita, and all the and low and all these other things, anything but her real name. And and the whole point of that is how dehumanizing it is to strip somebody of their name in that way yeah. and their identity. And so almost any like literature or movies after that book that really struggles with this issue, I think, are deeply impacted by that book, which is a you know, a canonical work of literature. Well, We've got John worried about what the whole world thinks about him, trying to define himself as Captain America, Bucky and Sam not having it. We've got Sam and Bucky fighting about all kinds of things. Who can call whom Buck? We've got everything around Isaiah and Bucky. And there's just a ton here. So I encourage folks to go back and rewatch the episode, just keeping this theme in mind. It'll shock you how much it drives the storytelling. But Maeve, what did you see thematically in this episode? You know... One of the things that really struck me about this as a superhero story, um, and this is something that we haven't talked about yet um, with respect to either of these shows, is that superhero story often replicates a lot of the themes and tropes and generic features of the cowboy story, the classic American Western. Mm. This is an anti-cowboy story in, in a really kind of basic way for, at the very beginning of the, uh, of the episode where Sam and Bucky are kind of fighting in hilarious ways um, about whether or not they're going to collaborate with one another, right? Sam's refusal to let Bucky in and his refusal to even tell him about the plan is a sort of sign of Sam's desire to kind of go it alone, like the classical cowboy out in the West, you know, sort of confronting the world and confronting all the people in it and, and, you know, and going alone, going it alone and, and succeeding and being the hero. And of course that fails fundamentally. It fails fundamentally in the very next scenes, right? We have a series of fight scenes that follow it where if they don't work together, right? And of course, you know, they need people to show up and help save the day, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the thing is, is that if, if, it, if that didn't happen, right, they, they, they would have, in fact, had their asses handed to them in an even more epic way. Um, but even Captain America, who shows up, shows up in that scene and is like, here I am to save, you know, the day, his, you know, th there's that wonderful moment where he flings his uh, sh mighty shield um, <laughs> <laughs> onto the road, um, you know, uh, and, you know, and, and, and basically keeps his you know, his buddy who's there to help him out from, uh, you know, being sort of eviscerated by the road. But then he jumps back up onto the the top of the of the the semi and is like, that was a terrible decision. And that was a terrible right. decision. Then he for him. immediately like, he gets his ass done. kicked. Yeah, exactly. That's the point is like he thinks that. And of course, that, that is kind of the story that we're hearing of 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 the new Captain America from beginning to end is that he thinks he has to do this alone. That kind of like monologue he's trying to deliver badly in the locker room is a sign of that. He wants to go it alone. Um, and that's and of course, that is the kind of classic American hero story is the story of the cowboy. The other scene that that I thought was really striking in this regard and 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 drew attention to this as a major theme is the scene when they're leaving the fight, right? And Sam and Bucky are walking along the road, and it's before the jeep arrives to you know to pick them up before Captain America convinces them to come aboard his mighty steed to go down <laughs> the road to the airport. Um, you know they're walking through this this landscape, and the way that scene is shot, right? We've got these two tiny people walking in a huge in a in a grand expanse of nature a very typical kind of scene from the sort of classic western film yeah wherever that western film is set and what they're talking about is the 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 is that disagreement about whether or not what they're just you know, wrangling with as it were um is the disagreement about whether or not they're actually going to continue working together and of course what we know over the course of the episode is that they have to work together or else everything will go pear-shaped well it, it's interesting because i feel like 
Yeah, I mean, very good call. Like the the superhero narrative owes everything to the Western, right? Yeah. <laughs> but like Captain America is actually kind of a classic Western character, like the, the yeah. Steve Rogers, like he's always shown as somebody who's leaving civilization to kind of go out on his own and taking the law into his own hands and stuff like that's in first Avenger that's in winter soldier. That's like the romanization in American mythos of like the man who the sort of, you know, the, the self, um, Self-reliant. Yeah, self-reliant, right? man. Yeah. <laughs> the the American myth of self-reliance, the, the yeah. person who can just do it all themselves. Now, Steve can because he's literally a superhero. He's had the super serum put into him. Yeah. Um, and now I think it, it brings, this series brings up the question of what happens when you don't have that kind of power that that really kind of this mythos of self-reliance like it's a crutch, right? Like, yeah. but yet we're all taught this myth and taught that if we somehow fail to be the like self-reliant cowboy sort, then we have failed as kind of Americans yet. Nobody actually is that because superheroes don't exist. Yeah. So, I mean, and the, the thing is, is that this, this sort of myth of self-reliance is not just the superhero story. And as, as you're saying, Amanda is not, it is also this sort of classic sort of narrative of Americanness, it comes straight out of American literature, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who writes this essay about self-reliance. He writes a series of essays that sort of bolster this kind of myth of self-reliance hmm. um, that it, it is basically, you know, I mean, what he does is, so in the essay called Self-Reliance, he describes society as a joint stock company. And, you know, there's a way in which, I mean, he's talking a little bit about the rise of capitalism and the way that capitalism sort of reduces our lives to sort of mere commercial exchanges, which, you know, I'm sympathetic to that argument that, you know, that we have, there's more in our lives than, you know, a mere sort of hope to it, to participate in commerce and then waiting to participate and then doing it, right? Like, there's more to our lives than commodities. On the other hand, this idea that society is is nothing more than that is, I mean, that's just a fundamentally undemocratic principle. And this show is really committed, because it's committed to, dis, I think, dismantling or questioning the myth of the cowboy, questioning the myth of self-reliance, is asking us to think about al alternatives to that. What, you know, what does it mean to work together with one another? And, but this is where I, I think it's so much fun to talk about like fiction can just do so much more than just even philosophical writings or dry analysis ever can yeah. because yeah. while I th I agree with you that this show is kind of leaning into like a more communal democratic view of what's of a good society. It also understands very fundamentally why the, the cowboy myth, the Emerson myth, you know, that sort of thing has such a draw on us because both Bucky and Sam are facing just all the annoyances of living in a bureaucratic society, like forced counseling, the right. cops swarming <laughs> them when they're just walking out of some dude's house. Like there are very visible downsides that even the most like socialistic of us could say <laughs> point to <laughs> in terms of like living in a, in a modern uh, unfortunately there's just almost no way to like organize a society that isn't going to have all these kinds of bureaucracies to it. And they are frustrating, but everything's a compromise and a trade-off in this world. Yeah. Cowboys are often romanticized as the last stand in a simpler time before the <laughs> pressures of modernity <laughs> crept in. And I do think our heroes feel a little bit of the same way here. Bucky yeah. obviously literally comes from a simpler time and pines for it and feels out of touch and out of place with that. But even Sam, pre-Steve's death and post-Steve's death, I think faces a different level of complexity of challenge that he's still wrestling with. So I just think it's really interesting that cowboys are seen as these defenders of a simpler space. And in fact, our heroes are nostalgic for that as much as like Western writers and readers were. Yeah, I mean, Maeve, you were the one who flagged for us uh, that how notable it was that Bucky mentioned that he's read the Hobbit. And yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Cause you know, the Hobbit is a, it, I mean, I hadn't thought about it this way until I was sort of thinking about the episode in terms of cowboys, 
But The Hobbit is its own kind of cowboy narrative. I mean, it's a classic hero story, but he has to like, he has to believe in himself in order to go out and, you know, and complete his mission. And there is a real, and we all have a nostalgia. I mean, there's, I mean, it's hard for me to imagine a, not a nostalgic feeling for a story like The Hobbit. I like that story too. Yeah. And, you know, and I, what do we do with that, right? Like, what do we do with that problem? And there are, there are lots of writers who are wrestling with that, right? Like somebody like, you know, Larry McMurtry, who, who in fact died today. Um, so uh, mm-hmm. as we're you know, recording ex- this, yeah, a, you know, uh, an extraordinary writer who wrote Brokeback Mountain, um, Brokeback Mountain, which also became a film. The nost- what's wonderful about the film also is, and and the novel too, is the way that those novels are written, and, and the novel, the way the novel is written, and the film is made in this really beautiful language and cinematography, right? So it captures the kind of romanticization of these things while also showing us the consequences of it, yeah. right? The sort of the isolation that comes from people who feel like they can't be who they fundamentally on the inside are um, while also want, aspiring to be something that is romanticized and heroized. Well, you know, kind of thinking about The Hobbit, uh, it is not like McMurdy's books. It's like Tolkien, like if you've ever read his books, like for all the good and, and wonderful things in them, then they really spawn fantasy. They also spawn some of the worst aspects of fantasy, which is like you said, this nostalgia for a time that never even really existed. Right. The cowboy narrative, Bilbo Baggins is somebody who literally leaves his little like the hobbits are characterized as these people that are small minded because of their little mini yeah. meals during the day and their tiny little <laughs> lives. And like the world is bigger and, and more magnificent out there. Yeah. If you strike out on your own and it's, if you leave behind community. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, yeah. it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not shitting on the Hobbit. It's just like you said, <laughs> like, <laughs> it, yeah, you are. You're totally shitting on the Hobbit. Everybody who likes the Hobbit should stop listening to this podcast right now. <laughs> But yeah, you can sort of see like they did that was, whenever a book or whenever a TV show or something like this has a direct illusion like that, you should definitely attend to it, you know? Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. So cowboys are pretty masculine. Maeve, does this episode have anything to say about masculinity if we're talking about cowboys? Um, I mean, I, I was actually really glad that this, I think this episode brings that up in a couple of different ways. And I was glad to see that um, in, in part because I was hoping that this show would address that. I mean, obviously the couple's therapy is sort of an obvious moment, that moment where they have to arrange their knees so that they're kind of interlocking. It's a sort of you know, almost kind of homo social moment, you know, where they're they're playing couple a couple in order to sort of work through their stuff. But there, there were a couple of other things that I, you know, obviously there's that when uh, Lamar says to John, "You can't punch your way out of problems," right? Sort of stripping away the idea that there that that there's a kind of macho. Um, masculinity that's being prioritized, that's not being prioritized here. Hmm. And, you know, and when I was thinking about all this, I was sort of just running through my notes about the shows, the two episodes we've seen, and I had forgotten that the log line for the very first episode um, on Disney Plus says that Sam Wilson learns of a rising threat while juggling challenges at home. <laughs> and that language is almost Oh, the idea, nobody, the only people who juggle challenges at home are women. Right. Yeah. yeah <laughs> right. Yeah. Narr- so, narratively speaking, that's often been the case. That's a great, great catch. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting that the show is really foregrounding this idea that, that Sam, I mean, we could say that it kind of feminizes Sam. I mean, the other way to think about this is that it kind of equalizes the playing field for who has to juggle shit at home. Yeah. Right. And, and so does John, right. In his relationship with Olivia, that, that moment where the two of them like lock, you know, pinky fingers yeah. and then kiss their fists or whatever. I was like, I, I kind of wish I had one of those like fun, like handshakes. That's so cute. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> you know, there's just something kind of nice about this, a superhero show about very mask, otherwise masculine superheroes that isn't prioritizing the kind of macho rep- representation of that su- super heroic masculinity. Well, and it's cool because like this is very much in the MCU's tradition around Steve Rogers and Captain America too. It's like a flat out total rejection of the 1950s tendency to treat the domestic sphere as emasculating, right? Right. 
I mean, you read a lot of mid-century literature of the John Updike sort, and it's like, <laughs> you know, you you walk in your own house and your balls come right off your body, right? <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's how it was often treated in that time. And Steve Rogers is a man of that time. And yet everything about the character is that he actually wants to go home and and be at home and live in this domestic life and that's uh, idealized and never shat upon as like a bad thing or a thing that somehow masculates him for wanting it. So we've talked a little bit about Ralph Waldo Emerson. We've talked about The Hobbit. We've talked about Brokeback Mountain. Maeve, what other works of literature, film, or TV did you see that might have related to this cowboy theme? So, you know, that scene, that the, the other, my other favorite scene, other than the couple's counseling scene, which is just played for, to, to excellent, hilarious, you know, sort of comic effect, um, that scene where they're walking through this sort of Western style, naturalistic landscape, the first thing that came to my mind was one of my favorite films of the past uh, few years. Uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Oh, yeah. Because that, first of all, I mean, I teach that film every time I can create a justification to teach it. I'm like, <laughs> does this belong in a in a course about British literature? I mean, why not? I might probably could figure it out. <laughs> I'm so jealous of your students. Like, I can't believe you, you. they get to learn about Mad Max Fury Road in school. That was not on the table <laughs> in college for me. It's such a beautifully made movie. And one of the one of the reasons that it is an extraordinary piece of filmmaking is because of the way that it invokes the cowboy romanticized naturalistic landscapes, you know, genre. So there's this moment, um, you know, where they're driving away through this huge, expansive landscape, very similar in in my mind to the, what we see in this scene with Sam and Bucky walking you know, through the, you know, on the road before the Jeep comes and gets them. So there's this moment where Nux, the, this, this character who's abandoned a Morton Joe, the bad guy, and is running behind the big rig and is trying to catch up. And this is a sign in my mind that this is a, you know, the big rig is kind of like the horse driving, riding mm -hmm. through the, the sort of natural landscape, but the horse doesn't have a single rider and it can't. Because that's a, this is a story about a revolutionary effort against a monstrous, tyrannical asshole, a Morton Joe, and it requires a, it requires this group effort. It mm. requires these people to join together and do this thing that no single individual can do. Yeah, right. It's not about the cow, one cowboy. It's about cowgirls and boys. Right. Well, and in that context, it's very much about cow, cowgirl and cowgirls and boys. Cow people. Yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously the classic, one of the classic Western stories is a woman, a young girl who is in trouble having to be rescued by our vigilante hero. Furioso takes that role in Mad Max Fury Road, but she's also like, it's completely recast as a man chivalrically rescuing girls and yeah. And recast as women saving themselves and and men. Yeah, and men saving themselves. But first women yeah. saving themselves and men going, yeah. "Oh shit, we can do that too." Uh, yeah. right. <laughs> we don't have to be tied down to this to this life, this story. Yeah. Well, no, that's right. And I think that brings me to a, another point though. I think that's really important to consider about the classic western narrative, which is it's super racist, like yeah. Um, you know, often who does the girl have to be rescued from in a classic Western Native Americans who are characterized as kidnappers and brutes and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I think when you call this show an anti-Western, it's very kind of explicitly thinking about the like cowboy, like the Lone Ranger, right? Yeah. Sure. The, cow yeah right. The, the cowboy, the white guy cowboy with his not white sidekick Tonto, who is yeah. kind of treated often like an idiot in Lone Ranger type stories. And certainly not, um, you know, he's a sidekick. And this, this, yeah. this series is really thinking um, pretty clearly about not only heroes and sidekicks, but who gets to be the hero and who gets to be the sidekick and, and how that gets racialized in our kind of imagination. And that really does go back to the Western. And that's, I mean, and, and, you know, again, the show draws attention immediately to that, right? It is, it, 
It's one of the things I really love about the show is that it's not shy about drawing attention to the very things it wants to drive home, right? So in in the Jeep, in this, you know, in the scene that immediately follows them walking through this kind of, you know, nearly Western landscape, although it's, you know, it's it's not in America. In the Jeep, right, the the mistake that that John makes is saying to Sam, how could I be Captain I can't remember exactly what he says, but how can I be Captain America without um without my uh wingman? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what he right? says. And Sam is like, you know, he he says something about how that's always the line, right? And it's like what's interesting is is that you need to think about that for a beat. Right. In order to really grasp the multiple layers of what Sam is referring to. Right. At, you know, as as the Captain America who could have been as the black American Captain America who could have been in the way that the 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 cowboy Western narrative always creates a hierarchy of heroes. There's always one person on top and then everybody else who's kind of like, you know, there to help out the real hero. And aside from the fact that that might be a fantasy that we like to participate in because, it allows us to kind of dig deep into the, de- you know, sort of single heroic person in an, a forbidding landscape and our, you know, if we have them libertarian fantasies about that, um, you know, it's just not true. Yeah, John Walker opens the episode with his black best friend and his black wife. And yet one of the final most important scenes we see of him is that he still puts Sam in that wingman slash yeah. sidekick box. And I do think that's part of why we're meant to see that Well, it's great that they're making John Walker more of a whole character because, again, most racists or most white people aren't just, you know, mustache twirling bad guys (laughs) that like these layers of privilege and bias run deep for all of us. And so I'm really excited to see where they take it because I I don't think it's going to be great. I don't think John Walker's got a (laughs) super heroic arc. The last thing I want to mention on this Cowboys thing that it made me think about was Cowboys live free from social constraint. Or mm. identities imposed by other people. That's part, again, of the romanticized nature of their narrative. And, and of course, they're almost exclusively stories about white guys, to Isaiah Bradley's point. But I think when we compare this theme, the theme of this notion of not anti-cowboy storytelling, and the theme we talked about earlier, which is identity and who gets to define someone, I think it's really interesting that there's a tension point between them, right? That Cowboys Mm. are trying to escape the very thing that we just talked about this episode also being very much about, which is other people telling you who you are (laughs) and what box you can fit in. So I think there's, I don't know, there's something there. I don't really have like a nice bow tie on that, but the tension between those feels real and important. I mean, good fiction is often about like acknowledging those tensions without necessarily giving us a pat moral. So, I mean, I'm glad to see... I think a lot of the time genre like superhero movies and other things like that get characterized as simplistic childish stories that do give us pat answers and pat morals. I think the MCU has done a really good job of of resisting that and it, it's not like um as much as I might like say a Harry Potter it's it's <laughs> not a children's story and it it continues yeah. to show that it's not yeah, and it's it, and it's reckoning with in really direct ways with the idea that whiteness in America is conceived of as a blank, mm-hmm. right? That the the reason that the cowboy gets to be free of social constraints or identities is because almost always he's white. Right. It's not just because then, of course, we've, you know, we've told ourselves a very different story of this while well, he's like pulled himself up by his bootstraps or he's <laughs> we've told, you know, we come up with, yeah, yuck, right. We've come up with this, you know, sort of recognizable narrative language to explain this. He's worked so hard. He's so rugged. He's so sunburned. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> right. Like oh, you know, all of these kind of signifiers of the things that he's done to get where he is. But this is a story about privilege. Right. And the power of privilege to free you into a space where you are you can define yourself. Yeah, these these are two incredibly powerful themes that you guys have pulled out. Does anybody have one more to talk about from this episode? Anything else you noticed? I mean, it it was really heavily signaled in the um, last week's episode thing. (laughs) And then just (laughs) throughout the episode. But it it really... um, a huge theme was the kind of tension between unity 
and coming together versus division, right? And okay. I think this is a theme that probably resonates a lot right now with us because I think it's a theme that is discussed in our political discourse a lot. Mm-hmm. Americans coming together, whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> um, <laughs> unity, I, you know, Joe Biden talks about unity a lot. And then all that ends up happening is people end up defining that in all sorts of ways. And, you know, a few notes I made in terms of like where we saw it, we see Sam and Bucky, they have to unify, but all they want to do is tear each other, like tear themselves apart. They never want to see each other again. You have Sam and Bucky as one team and the new Captain America team and the new Captain America team wants them on board and they don't want it. So we have that kind of tension. Right, right. And then I think most interestingly, we have the Flag Smashers themselves, who we haven't talked a lot about in this episode, but I think are going to become more and more important in their ideology because they their ideology is one of unity. That's what they one say. One world, one people. Yeah, one world, one people. It's very... <laughs> Yeah, that sounds awesome, right? It like, sounds who's, great. Who's not, who's not into that? And the very first thing we find out about them is actually they are very divisive. Have a, Actually, underneath that ha- happy language is a very divisive ideology of the, yeah. the people who were snapped versus the people who weren't. Like They have a very us versus them ideology mm. underlying that. And I, I thought that was really clever because I think that we see a lot of that particular problem in our society. And it, it shows you why the Flag Smashers are bad guys, I think, ultimately, even if they don't think that they are. Can, can you talk more about that, man? Because, I mean, if there's anybody in the world who has something to say about this, it's you. And I kind of want to hear what you have to say about that. Is that Yeah, like, what, what are the ways in which this is manifesting in, like, the real world, the same idea that you're talking about the Flag Smashers? Yeah. Well, I think it's really interesting how visually the Flag Smashers are represented in a way that I think reads on screen as being leftist, right? But actually, they have a really reactionary ideology and mentality in terms of a very er- us versus them, nostalgia for a time past. But most importantly, they really do kind of remind me of the alt right, which is. Like this kind of like we're all going to sort of unify together mentality is something that the alt-right kind of as divisive as they actually are. That's their sort of ideological justification for themselves. If you actually listen to watch Tucker Carlson's show or something. No, no, I don't want to. But yeah, but if you I'm good, thanks. Or read Media Matters (laughs) and they'll explain it. That's that's okay. Uh, Mm hmm. But like, this is what you'll get when you like listen to them actually explain themselves, which is the like, the alt right, like the kind of new fascist, whatever the fuck you want to call them. They will say, we don't like the way that the left causes racial division with all their identity politics, and that they mm. turn people against each other. And they can't we all just be Americans? Can't we all just be one? Why do you always have to talk about black and white and men and women and blah 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 and and they pretend that they are not invested in those differences even when they're more invested than anybody in those differences. Of course, yeah. And I, I see that with the Flag Smashers. They have a a surface ideology that's about coming together in unity, but right underneath it, like scratch it just a little. And it's a very divisive um, ideology that literally wants to expel a refugee class from the world. Yeah. Maeve. Are there any works of literature, film, or TV you can think of that tie into this kind of idea of this unity versus division thing? Well, I mean, one place we see this kind of narrative or this kind of theme cropping up is in stories about revolution. And there, you know, I mean, literally, there are countless of these. But, you know, what's interesting is that many of the ones where we have a group of people who are like, let's change the world in a fundamental way. And let's do it by erasing a whole section of the world, Hmm. right? Have a kind of ends justify the means argument at the heart of them, right? So, you know, for example, Dickens's Tale of Two Cities um, is a – Dickens is a tricky novelist because he seems like a, a, you know, a real lefty because he believes that the poor deserve care. (laughs) But he's actually pretty conservative, uh, you know, both on gender, number one, but we're not going to get into that. Um, And also on some class relations questions. Hmm. So Tale of Two Cities is a a tricky novel because 
it tells a story about revolutionaries who, in France, right, because it tells a story about the French Revolution um, and British people who get involved in it. Um, it, it tells a story about those revolutionaries that fundamentally questions whether or not they really believe in unity, right? Because they believe in elevating the poor, which is, I, I think, is a you know a, 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 an admirable goal that we can all get get behind, right? Um, but with 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 the necessary the necessary evil of executing people, right? Of of killing off the ruling classes, not getting the ruling classes to agree with us or persuading them that there might be a better, more democratic way of doing things, but executing people, right? And so the the whole novel is sort of into it is woven metaphors of execution that are of course are thematized as real things because the French revolutionaries did of course execute people it's where the guillotine comes from right. yeah, we know this right they got a little excited about it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean and maybe they weren't wrong right like you know it's hard to look back on the history of revolution and say well maybe if they just didn't use violence right like we don't we can't that i mean that's that's a yeah. we we of course can get into the weeds on that, but that's not a yeah. it's one not what we're doing here. There are plenty of podcasts probably about the French Revolution. Probably, um, but what's interesting to me is that Dickens does something that this show is also thematizing, which is the question about how do we make a better world, right? How do we build a better society, and how do we do it through something radical, including revolution, right? So. The and and at the core of that is a question about how do we do it together or do we do it divisively? And yeah. you know, and Dickens' answer to that question is that we have to do it together if we're going to do it at all. We have to do it through love rather than violence. A story like Les Miserables, or at least the modern adaptations of it, say something different that violence is necessary, and we can sing that song, and, <laughs> you know, and get to the barricades, and you know, it's all good. I think there's probably a book that's coming to mind for me that I think a little, probably anyone who took um, high school English has probably read, which is obviously George Orwell's Animal Farm. Yeah. Hmm. Deals with the question of revolutionaries who become the thing that they hate. And, and I think this book is taught a lot in high school because I like a very co conservatives yeah. who often dictate what, our schools teach read <laughs> it as a conservative book because it's anti Russian revolution functionally, mm -hmm. but it's, or it's anti it's critical of communists. Right. Yeah. But Orwell was himself a socialist. <laughs> He wasn't, he wasn't writing a conservative novel. He was writing a book about saying to people, don't become the thing you hate. Right. And, I don't know if that's where we're going with the flag smashers, but we have a lot of of kind of signposts suggesting that that might actually be. And also, you know, they think Thanos was right. Thanos was another example of an ide idealist who crossed into darkness because he had an ends justify the means argument going. Yeah. So what about this idea of one world government? Is there anything that comments on that that you guys can think of? I mean, the most obvious example is Star Trek, <laughs> right? Well, that's true. Yeah, sure. You know, the Federation is a dreamland, a utopia where everyone is free from want. As with Animal Farm, as with some of these other narratives, I don't think there's anything wrong with, like, to criticize an idealistic narrative is not to reject the ideals that are in it. But, like, Obviously, there's a lot of problems with the Federation as a concept and whether it's actually workable and whether merely technological advances would get us there. And I think that we're going to see like the Flag Smashers imagine the Federation, right? They imagine a, a one world government, <laughs> except you have to get rid of half the people to get there. <laughs> And like the Federation didn't do that, but I, I, it's cool to sort of see people like Marvel kind of actually look at some of the dark underbellies of what it takes, what sometimes people will do in order to chase their ideal like universes. You know, it's funny that you, you mention sort of one world government stories because there's a, a contemporary writer named Kanishk Tharoor, so T-H-A-R-O-O-R. Okay. Writer who has, I think it's only published one book so far. It's a collection of short stories called Swimmer Among the Stars. It's a really beautiful collection of stories. And he's got this 
short story in that collection, Swimmer Among the Stars, called A United Nations in Space. And it's totally bizarre. And I think it's worth a reread. I'm definitely going to reread this tomorrow uh, in light of what we've talked about because there so it's a it's a story about the United United Nations has decided to have a meeting in space because there's a brand new hotel that is uh, orbiting the earth. Uh, but when they get up there, some giant environmental catastrophe happens and it turns out that the members of the United Na- the, the 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 members who are representing the United Nations in space have to stay there potentially permanently. Um, And so it's this sort of, it's a fantasy about what would happen if in fact we were to imagine a one, a a, a sort of a singular government, but what it requires is that every, the entire earth is essentially demolished, right? (laughs) So everybody on earth dies (laughs) or that's the kind of implication is that they're not going to go back to earth because earth is being sort of destroyed, and and it's this sort of utopian space, but it's also it's almost psychedelic the way that the writing kind of describes it, which I think kind of enacts what you're talking about in terms of in a very very different kind of way. But this idea that that's kind of a fantasy the that we could take the nation states of the world, send them to a special place, and then have them like a space station, for example, like you know, Deep Space Nine or whatever it happens to be, or a hotel in space that wasn't designed for this, um, that we could send them there and they could just work out all the problems requires a sacrifice of some kind. Um, Whether in the case of this story, this kind of psychedelic narrative where the earth just kind of dissolves in front of their eyes and they watch it happen, or it's something utopian like Star Trek or whatever else. Well, and it's interesting because like, in Star Trek, like the kind of fantasy idealized version of this is one where you simultaneously get one world government that and peace on earth, and yet differences between people are not erased, cultural traditions are not erased. You are still French or Nigerian or Chinese, right? Right. Even though you there the the nations exist, but the state does not, right? Yeah. And in reality, like you said at the top of the podcast, Maeve, the reality that we've faced around in history of the one world government, it has existed in a sense. Like the sun never sets on the British Empire. Right. The yeah. Roman Empire. Like, and do the people that live under those one, in, in reality, what we've seen is actually one world governments are created by violence and yeah. oppression that often erases cultural to do traditions, destroys indigenous communities, just yeah. like decimates people. And, and is that's not a sacrifice because it's not even willing. It's just, it's just war. Yeah. And it's not enough to answer. I mean, that's an excellent point. It's not, it's not enough to answer that with, well, identity is a fiction, right? Like, right. Cause like, yes, identity is a fiction. On the other hand, the different kinds of people get to have different kind amounts of say in that context, over what their identity is, right? The, you know, the the colonized, you know, person in, you know, Kenya experience British experiencing British rule over them has less say over who their what their identity is than the person the person in the metropole in London, right? So it's yeah. not enough to just sort of like w- well be like well that's fine you know it, it's okay because all identity is a fiction. There are e- there are greater and lesser degrees to which people have sovereignty over their I- own identities, and acknowledging those things is exactly what the show is addressing in moments like where Captain America is like, "Well, what I want is uh, Cap's wingman," and Sam is like, "That's the problem, right? You you can't even see what the problem is. That's the problem." Yeah, I am. Um, it was interesting to me watching the Flag Smashers be portrayed as this like multiracial coalition because all I could think mm-hmm. about yeah. in terms of one world government is just this month, um, yet another language of the earth died when um, the last remaining speaker of it in an Amazonian tribe died of COVID. Oh my God. And that is what has happened all around the world. And it just happens over and over and over again. Thou- like hundreds of languages have disappeared off the planet because, and, you know, we can discuss whether that sort of thing is inevitable as, as a population of the planet grows and people just kind of run over each other's boundaries. But also a lot of that is just colonialism, just decimated people. And one world governments 
sound nice on paper and in practice, that's what happens. At least historically speaking, that's exactly right. They're a product of colonialism and imperialism and the unequal distribution of power and resources. Wow. So we've managed to tie this, all these themes together, if I'm <laughs> following, right? We've talked about identity and the question of who gets to define someone. And that you just guys, you guys circled that right back to this theme of unity versus division and these sort of problematic stories of one world governments. That's incredible. I think that's also a great place for us to leave it for this week. So again, rewatch this episode and think about these things. Who gets to define somebody and the privilege that comes along with the ability to do it by yourself? The lampooning of the myth of self-reliance, which Maeve pointed out, I think runs through this episode a considerable amount, and this tension between unity and division and the stories people tell about one when they really mean the other. Mm. Maeve, thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you. That was fun. Amanda, thank you so much for all these insights. Thank you. See you in just a few minutes. <laughs> you sure will. All right, Audio <laughs> Avengers, that is our show for today. Falcon and the Winter Soldier is way richer and more nuanced than so many people predicted, and we have a ton more to talk about on Character Cast and Ponder Vision, so please stay tuned for those on Monday and Wednesday. If you can, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or simply tell a friend about our show. Anything you can do to help us spread the word will make a huge difference. Until then, you guys, let's go get some couples therapy, shall we? 